Hi guys, now that we've covered um, an overview of rangeland management and what range is and um, all of the different components that go into the characteristics that make up a rangeland, I want to start getting a little deeper into um, the animal component of rangelands. So this lecture is going to be probably in two to three parts. Um, via a YouTube link and um, we're gonna cover a, a couple of different major concepts so you're gonna get a lot of information but it's not gonna be very deep so again this is a survey class so we don't have the ability to go um, very deep within each one of these major subjects um, so that would come in an advanced class all right, so the animals that are going to be present on rangeland are really categorized into three major types. Livestock, which I refer to as domestic species, uh, wildlife species, and then insects. Insects are critical to rangeland habitat, so we don't want to ignore um, those organisms. So let's make sure that we have um, our terminology down. A wild animal it refers to an animal that exists in its natural state. So our wildlife species are going to be, you know, really vast. So anything from deer, elk, moose, uh, pronghorn, bears, mountain lions, um, any of those wild animals that we end up talking about. Domestic animal is going to be an animal that has really become accustomed to human control and provision. And, um, I don't want to get too far off topic, but this whole dynamic between the domestic animals and the feral animals gets to be a very large gray area, and that's what we experience with the feral horses. So a feral animal is formally um, defined as a domesticated animal that has been allowed to revert to a wild state. So um, during the 1800s, if we just look at some of the horses, um, and the horse issues we have today, a lot of those horses actually ended up just being turned back out on the range because of severe drought and um, lack of water um, and lack of money on the human's part to care for them. So the different uh, feed types that these animals are going to consume while on rangeland um, are really going to help classify those animals into different types of grazers. Um, so herbivores are going to be animals that eat plant and vegetation matter only. So they're going to graze and browse on veg vegetation. So grazing tends to um, focus more towards our grass um, species and our forb species, whereas browsing, um, that verb actually refers to the uh, the ability to consume shrub materials or woody stemmed plants. Carnivores are of course our meat eaters um, so they're gonna spend an explicit amount of time and energy searching for their food, hunting their food, and then a very short amount of time consuming their food. Whereas an omnivore is going to be a crossbred between both of these types, um, so they're going to eat plants and animals, and they're also their diet's also going to consist of, um, on the vegetation side, um, really high energy substances like roots, berries, seeds, and very young shoots. So our omnivores, the best example we have of them are bears. So. One of the big um, controversies that ends up happening with rangeland animals, especially um, activist groups that don't like to see domesticated grazing animals on rangeland, um, really comes back to this concept of the cellulose dichotomy. So cellulose is the most abundant source of energy on rangelands, and that cellulotic structure is shown down at the bottom of the slide. And it is a very complicated three-ring structure that, uh, or not three-ring, it's got more than three rings, but um, the structure that is going to really make up a large percentage of plants that occur on rangeland. And so there's only a certain number of animals that can actually utilize uh, cellulose. And those are our concentrate selectors, our ruminants, and our hindgut fermenters. And the degree to which those 
category or those animals can use cellulose really um, is quite variable. So our concentrate selectors cannot um, digest uh, cellulose. So there's a few species out there that can digest a little bit for the but for the most part, our concentrate selectors cannot digest uh, large amounts of cellulose. Ruminants, however, were have evolved with a special four-part stomach. So it's not four stomachs, it's four parts to one stomach. Um, and within each one of those compartments are going to be um, millions and millions of species of different microbes and different families of microbes. And these microbes have specialized to break down cellulose. So the ruminant animal has the best ability to utilize all of the cellulose that occurs in plant form on rangeland. And then there's our hindgut fermenters. And these individuals um, are kind of the best of both wor worlds. So they can eat uh, concentrate rations. They can also eat a large amount of cellulotic uh, rations like our um, our browse and our grasses. So the hindgut fermenters, they um, do a similar similar fermentation process. It just happens a little further down the digestive system. So they, these individuals have cecums um, that has a microbial population to break down cellulose as well. So our concentrate selectors are going to be er are herbivores to, uh, or tend to be herbivores that have a limited ability to to go through the fermentation process and use cellulose. These are going to be birds and mice, and they're going to get a lot of their energy from uh, simple carbs, um, so like sugar and starches. So you're going to see them eat, eating lots of roots, berries, seeds, and young shoots. Carnivores don't have the ability to break down cellulose. They have to have protein. Um, and so those animals are going to be our wildlife species like wolves, coyotes, and mountain lions. And they're going to get their energy um, from preformed compounds in meat substances. So these animals need lots and lots of protein to survive. So they are going to eat meat, which already has protein um, as part of that uh, food stuff. And these individuals evolved this way because they end up spending a lot of time searching and hunting their prey and very little time consuming it. So they don't have a lot of time to go lay down like a cow does, regurgitate what they ate, chew it up again to get more breakdown in the digestive system. They have to have protein that is consumed once and goes straight to work um, in their metabolic system. Um... Also, our omnivores are going to be uh, concentrate selectors as well. So they are going to um, not have the ability to break down a lot of cellulose. So these, again, are going to be bears, um, pigs. Feral pigs have become a huge problem on rangeland. And then us as humans as well. And so these concentrate selectors, the omnivores are going to get their energy from plants and animals, um, but they also have the ability to eat um, preformed nutrients such as protein in the form of meat and very densely packed vegetation. So our ruminant species have an enlarged fermentation organ. Um, those are going to be the reticulum and the rumen. The rumen is where um, you're going to see the greatest population of microbes. Um, and those microbes are broke down into bacteria, protozoa, and fungi. And it's the bacteria and the protozoa that does a lot of the fermentation process. So our ruminants have the ability to break down cellulose into our volatile fatty acids or VFAs. So that's going to be um, um, uh, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And those uh, volatile fatty acids can be further used later in the system for energy by the animal. So again, our ruminants are going to be on the domestic species, cows, sheep, cows and sheep and goats. Um, on the wildlife species, they're going to be deer, elk, moose, and pronghorns. And then our hindgut fermenters. Uh, these are going to be our horses and um, as well as rabbits and some rodents. So these digesters are going to have a cecum that's a little further down in their digestive tract. In horses, it actually sets kind of on the barrel of their gut in their abdomen area. And uh, the 
cellulitic populations that occur in here are also going to break down that cellulose into volatile fatty acids that can be used as energy as well.